Cool. Okay. So our speaker today is Henry Charlesworth, who's an ML scientist at Rowden Technologies in Bristol. Um, and his talk today is entitled um, Solving Dexterous Manipulation Tasks with Trajectory Optimization and Reinforcement Learning. So I think I'll hand over to you, Henry. Yeah. All right. Thanks very much, Rich. Uh, yeah. Thanks for inviting me to talk. Um, so yeah, so I'm just going to try and give a talk. Uh, my, in my talk, I'm going to try and give kind of an overview of work that's been done within the field of reinforcement learning and trajectory optimization related to dexterous manipulation tasks um, and including some of the some of the research I did whilst I was a postdoc at the University of Warwick. Um, so I'll just start I guess with some kind of general motivation for why why dexterous manipulation is an interesting area of research um, and then talk about some of the challenges that are involved in uh, in these kind of problems. So I guess kind of the main motivation is that in in industry today, most a majority of um, a majority of robots that operate kind of manipulate objects using parallel jaw grippers. So something like this in the video. Um, and whilst you know, there's a lot of very impressive things they're able to do, um, it kind of requires that they operate in very structured environments where they're constantly seeing the same situations over and over again. Um, and so I guess the motivation for well, the, the, the long term motivation for looking at dexterous manipulation problems is that if you want to develop more autonomous robots that can operate in uncertain and unstructured environments, you're going to need to endow them with significantly more sophisticated manipulators. Um, and so then I guess there's obviously we know of a very versatile and sophisticated manipulator that exists in nature and that's the, the human hand um, and so it's kind of natural to look at building robotic hands that mimic the human hands in some way and then trying to train them to perform like similarly complicated manipulation tasks that that humans are able to um, so then it's just an example of you know the kind of things that skilled humans are able to do uh, and it's obviously very like we're able to perform very versatile manipulation tasks as well and uh so yeah so that's kind of the general motivation um so then the, the challenges with this these kind of problems uh are so certainly traditional robotics methods tend to tend to struggle i mean there's still a lot of interesting work that's done that tries to apply traditional robotics methods to these kind of problems but fundamentally they're quite difficult um largely because trying to model and optimize an accurate model of the physics of the system is, is very difficult. So, I mean, there's often very complex and discontinuous contact patterns that arise between the hand and objects trying to be manipulated. Um, and this is one of the main motivations for looking at using reinforcement learning or, or gradient-free trajectory optimization, uh, because these are methods that can learn without having to have a, an accurate physics model to optimize. Um, so they, they they just learn directly via interactions, um, and then the other the other obvious problem or the obvious obvious difficulty rather with um, dexterous manipulation problems is that they they're high dimensional, generally high dimensional state and action spaces, uh, and they usually require the quite precise coordination between the large number of joints in order for the task to be performed well, um, and that's obviously still a problem for reinforcement learning and trajectory optimization methods as well. Um, and so, I mean, yeah, so whilst there have been kind of a lot of notable successes, which I'll, I'll come on and show you some of the work that's been done, um, it's these, these, these kind of problems still remain a significant problem um, for, or a significant challenge for reinforcement learning uh, and other methods as well. Um, so just to give a very quick overview of reinforcement learning, uh, so probably a lot of people would know, most people would know kind of roughly what reinforcement learning is, but uh, I suppose, Roughly speaking, it's learning by trial and error. So learning by interacting with the environment, receiving feedback, and then updating behavior based on the feedback you receive. Um, and this can be done without requiring an analytic or differentiable model of the of the environment or, or the physics of the system. Um, and so you, you only need to be able to interact and gather experience in order to, to train a reinforcement learning agent. Um, and then deep reinforcement learning obviously makes use of deep neural networks um, to, to model the, the policy of the agent or the value function. 
um, and kind of the general loop is that you have an agent that's in, interacting with an environment of actions and then the environment will return the next the, the state and then there's some reward function defined that is what the agent is trying to maximize. Um, and then gradient free trajectory optimization is, is slightly different. I mean, unlike reinforcement learning, there's no there's no real learning that goes on, but you're instead trying to directly optimize it, optimize a trajectory by interacting with the environment. So because it's gradient free, it's still it has the similarity with reinforcement learning that you, you don't require access to a, a physics model of the environment that you, to optimize. Um, and you instead perform the optimization by gathering experience and optimizing the model without without requiring any any gradients directly um, so just like a really simple example of this is random shooting um, so if you imagine at each each time step in a trajectory that the agent's trying to plan its next action it will generate n n random sequences out to some future time horizon so you imagine modeling n different future horizons up to some number of steps into the future and then evaluating these with with the environment, which you know could be a simulator or a learned model, um, and then obtaining the sum of rewards over that finite time horizon, and then choosing the initial action sequence with the the highest sum of rewards, um, and then executing that, and then moving on to the next step, and then replanning. Um, so that's kind of a really simple example of a gradient-free trajectory optimization technique, um, which actually works surprisingly well on simple control tasks, um, but it obviously doesn't really scale to High dimensional action spaces and particularly for dexterous manipulation uh, you have to have to kind of do something a bit more intelligent before you're able to to make any progress with that um, so yeah so now i'll just kind of move on to give a background of some of the some of some of the previous work that's been done within within the field of reinforcement learning and trajectory optimization that's looked specifically at dexterous manipulation tasks um, so one of the earliest things was uh, OpenAI released some uh, some environments, some simulated environments. Obviously, so it's a simulated a simulated model of a real robotic hand, a shadow shadow hand, um, and the tasks are there's different objects, and you either have to or the hand either has to rotate the object to a given orientation or rotate it to an orientation and to the position that it's given, um, and the object can be an egg, a block, or a or a pen. Um, and they showed that they could achieve kind of partial success on these environments using hindsight experience replay. Um, so I mean, on on the actually manipulating the egg was the easiest because I guess it's it's quite easy to rotate the egg; it kind of slides quite smoothly. Um, and if you're just rotating the block, they're able to get that to work relatively well as well. Um, but I mean, manipulating the whole block was a lot harder. They, that the agent struggled kind of a lot more to do that. I suppose that kind of makes sense because it's harder to rotate the block because you have kind of the corners and it doesn't, doesn't slide as smoothly. Um, and then, then with the pen, uh, it's even, even more difficult because it's quite easy for the pen to get kind of stuck between, between the, the fingers of the, of the agent. Um, so that was, one, that was one piece of early work that was done. Um, and then some some other work that was done looked at kind of a different simulated robotic hands, but obviously very very similar overall. But um, and they had so that they looked at four different tasks. So there's the object relocation task, um, which yeah, moving an object, picking up an object and moving it. Uh, in hand manipulation, uh, so kind of got like a small pen and rotating it to a given orientation, um, and then a tool use environment. Um, so using a using a hammer to hit a nail in, um, and then opening a door, um, and so what they what they showed in this paper was that um, kind of standard model free reinforcement learning methods actually could solve these tasks if you gave if you gave it like a highly shaped reward function, so like a a, a very a regular reward that directs the agent to finish the task. Um, then it was able to solve these tasks quite well. So yeah, I, should, I probably should have mentioned that with the OpenAI gym tasks, if I go uh, back to the to these, the, the reward is completely sparse, uh, at least for hindsight experience replay. So the agent only gets a reward once it's finished the full task, uh, which obviously makes it 
significantly more difficult. Um, but yeah, so with these tasks, they showed that kind of standard RL could could solve these tasks, uh, but it was very sample inefficient um, and also led to quite kind of unnatural movements. Um, and so what they did was combine it. They combined reinforcement learning with uh, demonstrations gathered in virtual reality uh, and showed that this could significantly improve the performance. So I mean, all, all these example videos are with the demonstrations, uh, combining the demonstrations with reinforcement learning. And so just to show the kind of art, like strange behavior, if you look at the middle video, um, you get there's slightly odd artifacts. So the RL does learn to solve the task, but it does it in a strange way um, because obviously there's no reason. It just there's nothing telling it not to do that. So it just learns some way of uh, doing it. But then obviously with when it's guided by demonstrations, it learns kind of more natural behavior. Um, so then coming on to a more kind of advanced trajectory optimization method, um, which was, I mean, it's, it, I, I'll, I'll probably go, I'll go into a bit more detail because it was, it's relevant to the, uh, to the research I did. Um, so there was a paper that kind of demonstrated that this trajectory optimization method model predictive path integral control could be used to solve some dexterous manipulation tasks. So, I mean, the example they had was just in hand manipulation of a cube, rotating it to a given orientation. Um, and so the basic idea is the kind of structure is similar to the random shooting uh, algorithm that I mentioned before. Uh, in terms of so model predictive control. So what that, that generally means is that at each time step, you kind of re replan the whole by modeling some number of future trajectories and then deciding the next action for the next step only. Um, but then the actual planning process is a bit more complicated than the random shooting. So, I mean, you, you initialize some multi-dimensional vector of um, mean actions, I guess. So you have, so N is kind of the number of trajectories you're gonna model forward. Uh, H is the planning horizon. So how far into the future you're going to model. And then this AD is the dimension of each action. So obviously each action is made up of every single action that each joint execute executes so i mean generally it's kind of somewhere around 24 dimensional for these kind of static hands um and then so you you plan over a number of iterations um and you so you, we have this kind of action coupling term basically so you the motivation is that it, it kind of smooths out the action sequences so you the actual action you execute is like a a linear combination of this mean action that you're going to get from planning plus the previous action you took um, and so the motivation is that it's it, it leads to smoother action sequences and that in effect in effect means that you're it slightly reduces the space that you have to search through because it means that some actions are just not possible because because there, there has to be some well i mean as long as beta is um if, if beta is kind of between zero and one, then there's some weighting given to the previous action. Um, and so, yeah, so it makes the, the action sequences smoother. Um, but yeah, so with the, with the planning process, you kind of, you have this, you initially, you initialize this, this vector randomly, um, and then you evaluate the actions and you evaluate them with the, the simulator, or it could be a learned model that, that you've got. Um, and you assign each trajectory a score, which is just the sum of rewards over the, the the number of steps you're planning for, um, and then you update your estimate. You 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 kind of calculate an updated average by you you weight each trajectory by the reward, and you take an exponential. Uh, and then this row is just a parameter that's like kind of a hyperparameter that you choose, um, and then you use this to update your uh, kind of mean mean action sequence. And then for the next iteration, you make, you kind of initialize, you, you kind of reinitialize this new IJK um, with copies of this, this mean action sequence you've got. Um, and that, and then you add noise to all of them. So at each step, you, you're updating this kind of average traje like trajectory of actions, and then you add noise to them, you reevaluate them, and then you, calculate this exponential exponentially weighted average to try and like focus on 
on the actions. So the, the, obviously the actions that lead to the action sequences that lead to higher sums of rewards are given more weight than um, the ones that don't. Uh, so yeah, so that's kind of the, this, this is the well, MPPVI algorithm. Um, and so then another paper that kind of made use of MPPVI, but within the context of uh, model-based reinforcement learning. So it's, it, it learns an ensemble of models, or well, the idea is it learns an ensemble of models from the data it gathers. And then using those models, it plans using that trajectory optimization algorithm, but rather than evaluating each sequence of trajectories with the simulator, like the exact simulator, it will instead evaluate them using the, the model that it learns. Um, and so they were able to you know, solve a number of tasks doing this. Um, so yeah, well, you can, yeah, you can see them. So like rotating these balls in, in the hand and kind of guiding a, a pencil to draw. Um, and also interestingly, they were at, this was actually sample efficient enough to operate on a real robotic hand. So they kind of had this automatic reset mechanism that where they programmed this other robot hand to kind of put the balls into the robot's hand and then it could start interacting and gathering experience for itself. And then when it, if it dropped them, then this, the, the other robot would kind of automatically reset it. Um, and that allowed it to gather enough experience to actually train um, by itself to perform the task. Um, so that was, that, that's, that was quite impressive. Um, and then, so yeah, coming on to some of the work that OpenAI did. So I mean, it's possible that some of you might have seen this stuff before because it did receive quite a lot of publicity. Um, so they basically applied very large scale distributed reinforcement learning to, to solve a dexterous manipulation task. Um, so initially what they did was training to get, get a robot hand to kind of rotate a block as we've kind of seen, but we've seen it in simulation. Um, and so they actually trained completely in simulation, um, but what they did was vary the simulation parameters. So like they trained on a, a wide variety of simulations where it, each simulation had slightly different friction and elasticity and just generally different parameters within the simulation. Uh, and they tried to train a model that was really robust to all of these. Um, and it was obviously robust enough that it could actually be deployed on a real, on a real robot, um, which was, obviously very, very cool and very impressive. Um, but I think it's worth noting that it did require like a huge amount of computation. Uh, so they used like 6,000 CPU cores, eight GPUs for two days to get the policy for, the, for this. And that's, so that amounts to kind of like a hundred years of experience. Um, and then they followed this up with kind of even, uh, kind of an even more impressive example, I guess. So training an agent to, to solve a Rubik's cube, or they, well, they didn't train it to solve a Rubik's cube. They trained it to execute the instructions given to it by a Rubik's cube solver. Um, but I mean, from the point of view of dexterous manipulation, that's the part that's interesting. Um, and it was kind of, they used a similar method, but they had some, it was a slightly more advanced automatic domain randomization. So this is the idea of randomizing the simulation so that it, so that the policy that's trained is really robust to, um, to differences, because obviously the real robot, no, no simulation is ever going to be perfect. So the real robot is going to have like subtle differences with the with any given simulated environment. But the idea is obviously, if you train on enough variations of the simulated environment, it it could still work. Um, <clears throat> and it, it does some, it did they did some clever stuff like building up gradually how much domain randomization there was to improve the training or to. Kind of more efficiently train it um but again like if you thought the previous amount of compute was a lot they, <laughs> they used a lot more for this like 64 gps 30,000 cpu cores and trained for several months to actually get it to to work properly um but i mean it's still you know it's impressive you can see it i mean you can see that it's still it's far from perfect like it still kind of struggles to to execute each action but it is impressive that it eventually is able to execute every single action and um, finish the cube. So I obviously won't watch the whole video, just kind of skip ahead and show that it does actually get there in the end. Uh, yeah. Um, so I mean, that, that, yeah. So I mean, I guess that's probably, probably the most impressive example, but I think it's just worth emphasizing again, like how, 
how much compute power was required to get there. Um, so, so yeah, so now I'm just gonna come on to the, some of the research I did whilst I was a postdoc at, at Warwick. Um, so the first thing we did was just build some additional tasks that, um, that were quite interesting. So kind of basing it on the open AI gym environments, um, but introducing some, some new tasks. So the first ones were these kind of object handover tasks. So obviously the agent now controls two hands rather than just a single hand. So that's already kind of doubling the state and action space. Um, and there's a t then the task is handing over an egg, uh, handing over a block. <laughs> um, and then so the, the other hand has to move it to the required position and orientation um, and then handing over a pen. Uh, and so this is showing these videos are from our traje the trajectory optimization algorithm we used. Um, so it's kind of spoiling it slightly, but <laughs> it just showed that we did, we did get the results that uh, we were able to kind of solve these environments. Um, uh, and then the other, some of the other environments are kind of similar, but, but in, in all of those tasks, the, the hands are, like the bases are fixed. So it's only the fingers that are able to move. Um, so in these ones, we kind of gave the bases some extra degrees of freedom. So they're able to translate and rotate kind of within some, some range. Um, and then this, the task is just throwing the object from one hand to the other, and then the other hand has to move it to the position and orientation that it's desired. Uh, uh, and obviously, yeah, so this is all done uh, in simulation. Um, and then, so then overarm variation and underarm variation. Um, uh, and then the other, the other variation, which is a bit harder is two objects. So each hand has an object, but the, the goal for that object is only achievable by the other hand. So they have to kind of swap, swap objects. So they have to learn to throw so, I mean, you see in that case it failed or only one of them succeeded, um, but in that in this one i think uh, well it learns a slightly strange way but then that one worked a bit better um obviously that that task is a bit harder so it, it didn't get uh wasn't fully solved i guess um but it's still we were still able to kind of learn or not well the trajectory optimization was still able to produce kind of good trajectories for that um and then the other the other task is this pen spin task um so this is identical to the OpenAI gym environment, but with a redefined reward function. Uh, so rather than moving a pen to a desired position or orientation, um, it, we just instead defined a reward function that encouraged it to be spun around. Um, and I would say this is probably, well, this is, this is definitely the most difficult task. I mean, even though it's only a single hand, uh, it definitely kind of required the highest degree of dexterity. And it's kind of, it's difficult for humans as well. I mean, I can, I can sort of, do it slowly after a bit of practice, but it's not, I, I'm not still not very good at it. Um, so yeah, so I'll come on to kind of how we how we did that in a bit. Um, but yeah, so our, our, traje our trajectory optimization algorithm we used for, for these tasks. So it was, it was based, it was kind of building on top of MPPI, which I talked about earlier. So, but then with a couple of like relatively small changes, but changes that made a big difference in performance to, for these for these kind of tasks um so i mean with mppi you 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 evaluate these future trajectories and then you you take an exponentially weighted average to to update the uh to update the this kind of average uh trajectory and then you make copies of that and add noise to it um so what we decided was rather than averaging, just take some fraction of the highest performing trajectories. So say like 5% of them and then duplicate them. So rather than making N copies of an average, make, so well, if it's 5%, you would make, you make, make up copies, just uniformly make copies of 5% of the trajectories to fill up the, the number of trajectories for the next iteration. Um, and then the next the next change was that just for each duplicated trajectory, um, only add noise to a subset of the dimensions and time steps. So in MPPI, when you you make you make the copies of this average this average trajectory, and then you add noise to all of them, 
so that you add noise to the whole trajectory and then you calculate a new average and then you add noise to the whole thing and then you, you, you kind of iterate that. Um, but what we decided was just add noise to a subset. So if this is the time dimension and this is the, like, the action dimension, only add noise to, to some, some of these. And the motivation is that kind of if, you, if you're trying to perform a very precise manipulation task, you might have a solution that is doing quite well uh, and if you add noise to all of it, there's a high chance you might just kind of destroy it completely. But if you just add noise to a little bit of it, you might just get an, a boost of, in performance. Um, and then you can kind of iterate on that. And I guess I, I, I kind of think of it as an analogy to evolution, I guess. So like if you have, a, obviously I'm not, not a biologist at all, but if you, you have like a, <coughs> you have a, a, a sequence of genes, if you mutate all of them at once, you're probably just going to destroy everything but if you just mutate a couple of them you're going to kind of improve the performance or i mean over time with lots of copies of lots of copies and lots of mutations you're you're able to kind of gradually increase performance bit by bit um and i think for the kind of precise manipulation tasks because these are obviously high dimensional and you have to kind of simulate quite a large number of time steps into the future as well um it, it does it does lead to quite significantly improved performance and then the final thing is rather than so i mean with with it with the kind of standard model predictive control you you reinitialize this the, the planning at every time step so you you take one step in the environment and you do this large planning step and then you take one more step and you take this um so rather than restart the planning from scratch every time step we thought just, just carry over what you've calculated from last time and use that as kind of the initialization for the next planning step uh, and then perform more planning on top of that. Um, and so initially we just tested this on the, the most challenging open AI gym manipulation tasks. So these are the ones where you have to move the, so not, not just rotate the object, but also move the object to the, the desired position as well. Um, so you can see that we got significantly higher performance with our method compared to MPPI and also compared to the kind of the, the reinforcement learning methods as well. Um, and then the, the pen, um, with the pen, it's obviously it's, it's even more, more challenging really, because as I said, it's kind of easy for the pen to get stuck between the agent's fingers. Um, and so, I mean, some of them, some of the examples, it doesn't actually do very well. I mean, I think it did get there for that one. Um, So yeah, so it gets a pretty high percentage of success, so over eighty percent on the pen on the pen task, and nearly hundred percent with the block. Um, and then I already, um, so I already kind of spoiled the videos of on the other tasks that we we built ourselves. So the the catching environments and the the object handover environments, um, and so we see that kind of on. Just a subset of these so egg handover pen handover egg catch block handover egg catch underarm and, and then two egg catch it leads to significant improvements in, in performance like the, just the simple changes we made to the trajectory optimization algorithm um and then it's basically only the pen spin task that <coughs> really was a significant challenge still that um so yeah i'll, I'll come to, i'll come to that in a bit because we did that was kind of separate um and then also just to show that we also tried this. So, so it, it doesn't just work on dexterous manipulation tasks. So just tried it out on a different environment as well. Um, so this humanoid environment, um, and you see it learns kind of, well, I don't know if that, I should really call that running or not. It learns something, but the reward is basically how fast it can move to the right. So it's, it, it learns to optimize the reward well, um, but it's quite interesting behavior that it ends up coming out. Um, and it significantly like improves over reinforcement learning methods. Um, so yeah, so then coming on to the pen spin task. So this, yeah, as I as I've mentioned, this was kind of the, the most difficult one. Um, and so if you look at like uh, one of the state of the art RL algorithms for continuous control uh, TD3, it just completely fails on this task. So it just it just drops the pen and um, it doesn't really learn to do anything. Uh, and then, so our trajectory optimization method, it's actually worked surprise, like it worked quite well. Like it learns to start 
or I say learned it, the trajectory that it generates start, starts to spin the pen, uh, but you'll see that it kind of ends up eventually failing. Um, and there's probably, I think I'll show a few examples um, and it does kind of roughly the same thing each time. So it's able to get the pen to start spinning, <coughs> um, but eventually it, eventually it makes a mistake. And I think, I think well, the reason this happens is because it, it's planning over a finite horizon. So it, it, it obviously learns a plan over the number of time steps it's planning over that gets it quite a lot of reward, but it's, it gets it quite a lot of reward, but then it puts itself in a state where it, it doesn't plan over enough time steps, basically. It's quite short-sighted. Um, and you can try and increase the number of time steps you plan over, but then it just eventually will stop working because it becomes a very high dimensional problem at that point. It's already a high dimensional problem, um, kind of. So I think this is planning over 25 time steps. So you've got, you're planning over each, each time step. The action space is like 24 dimensional or something like that, then times 25. So you're, you're trying to optimize over a very high dimensional continuous space. Um, uh, and so, but the thing is, so obviously reinforcement learning failed, but in principle, reinforcement learning can plan over a very long time horizon. Um, and so the idea that we came up with was to try and use the trajectory optimization algorithm. So the suboptimal examples that I showed you in the previous slide that we got from our trajectory optimization algorithm um, and use those to kind of guide the reinforcement learning. Um, so basically what it did was just regularly reload the simulator to states that are seen on the example trajectories and then gather short rollouts from those from those trajectories. Um, and then, so you're basically showing the reinforcement learning algorithm, like lots of examples of states that can lead to high rewards. And also, I mean, for example, if you kind of, <clears throat> it's quite difficult to get the pen started. So it has to kind of learn a reasonably complicated sequence of actions to start spinning the pen. But if you use the suboptimal examples we had already, um, you're giving it lots of examples where it's in a position where starting to spin the pen is a lot easier. Um, so it's able to, like you can see that clearly combining it with the trajectory optimization, combi combining reinforcement learning with the trajectory optimization examples clearly leads to like massively improved performance. And you can see that it learns to kind of spin the pen. Um, <clears throat> and actually it just runs it runs for a lot, a lot longer. So it will run for this. It, as far as I can tell, it just kind of spins the pen indefinitely at that point. Um, so that's, that's, that's quite good. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I, as I say, like, I can't do this. So this is quite a difficult manipulation task um, and it's all fully autonomous. There's no, although we're using, we're using examples, but those examples are still generated autonomously. So, um, and also no, no supercomputer is required. Like it's not a cheap, it's still not computationally cheap, but I, it, I was just running it on the sort of like 20 CPU cores, say, for, to, to generate the trajectories um, rather than the kind of crazy amount of compute that was needed for, for, for the other things. Um, so yeah, so just on to the conclusion. So I guess just hopefully convinced you that dexterous manipulation problems are kind of interesting and challenging, um, but that, that we're starting to make good progress on them. Um, and I think there's already, there's already some impressive examples of reinforcement learning and trajectory optimization um, being applied to these problems. Um, even, and you know, they, uh, the most impressive examples do require a lot of compute uh, still. Um, and I think, I mean, even though I demonstrated that you can solve some fairly challenging tasks with methods that don't require enormous amounts of compute. It's still, they're still too computationally expensive to be actually be deployed in any kind of real situation. So I think there's still, still kind of lots of work to do in the, in the area, but it's, it's um, yeah, as I say, lots of interesting work that's been done and progress is being made. Um, so yeah, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Cool. Thanks, Henry. That's awesome. So we've got a question in the chat from Rory, um, and the question is, how did the original robot arm have feedback to learn to juggle balls? So I'm guessing, obviously, Rory, do elaborate on this if, if I've not got that right, but I'm guessing this is to do with the reward function. Uh, yeah, which one, sorry? the. Uh... Um, 
I could actually unmute you, Rory, if you if you want to. Oh no, I can't. Sorry. Oh, this one, can I? So is it maybe that maybe this one, like the juggling? What was the? Uh... Sorry, Rory, I'm not sure I can. Um, going back to when the robot arm was passing the handballs. Yeah, so, so, is, it, uh, so is, it, is it this one where they're kind of exchanging the... Yeah, I think so. Yeah, so the yeah the reward function... Uh, yeah, so we did, we did have to use a dense reward function here. So it's it's kind of a sum of the, the distance, basically the distance of the object from the desired position. And then also uh, there's a rotational component. So like how far it needs to rotate to get to its desired position as well. Um, and then kind of for each object, summing those together. And that, that acts as the reward function for that. Cool. Sarah's asked, um, could you use a human control in the hand to provide a model for the ML training? Uh, yeah, so yeah, so that's, um, that is what was done uh, in uh, one of the earlier ones. Um, so yeah so this this one this paper um so when they when they 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 so they 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 did they showed that model free reinforcement learning could could solve these tasks but it, it often led to kind of unnatural behavior and was very sample inefficient um but yeah they 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 found that so they gathered demonstrations in virtual reality um and then they combined those with reinforcement learning so in a, in a kind of similar way to how i mentioned combining the demonstrations with um that we that I got from the trajectory optimization with reinforcement learning, this was kind of combining actual demonstrations that humans gathered with reinforcement learning, um, and yeah, they they showed that so that this is what this on the right is, um, and it obviously it learns more natural behaviour and it learns much more quickly as well if you look at kind of how quickly it learns. Um, and in terms of the sort of the agent's sort of understanding of its current state. I mean, presumably it understands like the orientation of its hand and all the joints and everything. And does it understand sort of the orientation of the pen or, or something like that? Um, so it, it, well, it depends. So I think, so actually for the, for the trajectory optimization methods, you don't really need to give it a state at all because it's operating directly on the actions. Um, right, I see. But for the reinforcement learning, yes, the they the reinforcement learning agents. Obviously, you give it a state representation. I can't remember exactly what is in them, but I think, I imagine it, it definitely has all the information about the joints, of the hand, and I think probably about the pen as well, uh, or the object. Because uh, in the video that you showed, was it? I think it was OpenAI's video. It looked like there was a camera or something. Oh yeah, things. I think for the yeah. So for these ones, I think they added a lot of extra sensors and they had cameras from different angles and. Yeah, I mean, what they did was obviously quite co complex. Uh, they they did. I don't know the details actually, but they yeah they they did it, do some vision stuff as well as. Uh, it looks like there's some kind of markers on the end of the fingers, maybe that are being picked up somewhere. Yeah, probably measuring things like the contact forces and things like that as well. Um, cool. There's another question from Sarah here around: Is there any particular use cases in mind for this type of work? Is this sort of just Oh, I guess I suppose anything really, but is there a particular thing that Warwick are interested in applying this to? Um, I don't know if War about Warwick particularly. Uh, I mean, the group is focusing mainly on kind of fundamental research rather than, um, I don't think they're thinking about any specific application at the moment. I I don't know. I mean, there were there, there was talk about applications in like in medicine, but I think it's a bit, like it, it's a long way off getting to that stage. Uh, yeah, I guess you'd want to start somewhere a little less crucial <laughs> yeah. than medicine to start. With. Yeah, probably. Yeah, um, maybe manufacture or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Cool. I think there's a, a final question. If anyone else has any questions, stick them in the chat. But there's a question from Julian around the trajectory optimization slide. What were the sort of primary challenges that you that you faced there? Uh, so is this? Uh, I'm guessing the slide with the uh, the equation that the uh, oh is that okay? Uh, sorry. Uh, so this this one probably. Um, um, so I mean I guess 
so the main, I guess the main problems, well, so obviously we started with MPPPI, which is an existing algorithm. Um, and then it obviously it, it, it works quite well, but we, we could show that it didn't work as well as we would want on the kind of environments we were looking at. Um, and so I guess we just kind of had to kind of think about why, why that was. Um, and yeah, it just, it just, it seems, it seemed that the averaging procedure, like you could imagine the averaging kind of, if you, if you, if it's really difficult to make progress in, in improving the trajectory, a, a, a procedure that kind of averages everything is going to potentially throw away the, or if only like a very small number of trajectories perform highly, um, then something that averages over all of them is, even if it's like weighted by the reward, is going to throw away the information about the best, the, the most highly performing trajectories. Um, I don't, I mean, if the question is in terms of what challenges there still are with this, this method, I guess the main ones are that it's computationally very intensive, even with the changes we made, like it doesn't run in real time. For example, you have to kind of, you have to create the trajectories offline. Um, what sort of times are you talking about there? Is it like hours or? Uh, yeah, I mean, hours probably. I mean, you can play around with the parameters and get good, like quite good performance in short amounts of time. Um, obviously it's kind of, it's one of those things that the longer you, or the more iterations you run it for, the better it gets. Um, but I mean, yeah, for a single trajectory, I think it depends on the, the environment as well, but for for quite a few of them, probably a couple of hours. Um, is, it, is this something that's speeded up with more, is it GPU in terms uh, of? It's not, not GPU, it's, it's all CPU. So I mean, actually, yeah, it's very, the, the good thing is that it's highly parallelizable. So, I mean, you could, mm -hmm. if you had a, a lot of CPUs, I mean, I suppose if you had as many CPUs as OpenAI do, you could probably run it in real time. Um, yeah, fair enough, yeah. Cool. Okay. Well, I think um, on that note, that's the last of our questions. So thanks very much for talking and um, thanks everyone for attending and we'll see you again soon. Okay. Thanks everyone.